We are talking once again with Ari Cohn. He is the founder and president of the Post Prison Education Program, and we are doing the July edition of the Post Prison Education Program radio show. Ari, take it away. Thanks, Mike. Um, today, we want to talk about uh, programs being denied by the state to prisoners. Um, and that happened to have been Emma Hogan's field of study on which she did, she did her like 85, 90 page in depth thesis uh, before she graduated. And so we're gonna, Emma's gonna lead a discussion about Washington State denying prisoners programs that they need to have a successful life and then with us also, so, so I'm Ari, the older, and then Ari, the younger, is down here, Ari Rose Marquez. And Adrian Tunney is yakking away on the phone, probably talking to a prisoner, is, is going to join the conversation. So Emma, take it away. All right. Yeah, so we want to talk about um, program various programming, but um, in particular, um barriers to educational programming um educational access in prisons um i think there are some public misconceptions and we've talked about this like um kind of on a larger scale like rooted in uh, meritocracy and those kinds of um you know values in america that um these people who are incarcerated are able to kind of like pick themselves up from the bootstraps. I think that's the saying. Um, and essentially, um, like that it's it's their choice to participate in educational programming and that they are um, somehow able to, um, you know, make choices that make them able to be more successful when they reenter society. And we wanna talk about how many times that is just absolutely not the case. There are so many barriers for individuals to um, have the chance to participate in this programming, um, such as, you know, infractions that restrict them from participating at all um, to, uh, you know, one of the more upsetting um, cases for us this week had to do with the hard cutoff um, of years left on someone's sentence um, that restrict them from being able to participate in any educational programming or programming in general. but. Um, and yeah, so I think uh, definitely that's one of my main focuses in my work that I plan on um, pursuing for the rest of my career is um, just the inaccessibility of education to um, worthy, motivated, driven, um, intelligent students who have, uh, you know, who want badly and have seized any, every educational um, opportunity that has come their way and still are barred um, access to educational opportunities. Um, and I think that's uh, dehumanizing and wrong, like I've talked about, and I think um, just a lot of the individuals that we are working with, just issues that have come up on a day-to-day -day basis with us working in student services, um, even in the past few weeks, illustrate um, just kind of like the vast array of barriers in place for people to participate in educational programming at all, regardless of the quality of the educational programming, regardless of you know um, how you know, capable they are once they get there, like people are not able to access these opportunities at all. So I think that the stories, um, you know, kind of illustrate this and um, speak to the issue best. So I wanted to go um, around and we can talk about some different, um, the stories of some individuals that we're working with. And um, do we wanna start with Douglas Allen? You know, I was, you know, I, 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 I was listening to you talk. I was just remembering quite a few years ago. So just so everybody, everybody knows, if you're, if you have more than four years left on your sentence, it, it's, it's somewhere between difficult and impossible to get into programming classes. 
And the DOC says that's because they don't have the money to do it. Uh, and um, which means that the legislature is responsible for this problem. So, like, what's new? I mean, if you if you're looking for the bad actors in society, you need look no farther than government. The people in prison are not the bad actors in society. The bad actors in society that I think are causing the, the worst, most difficult problems from mal due to mal malfeasance and misfeasance. It's, it's government at every level, but in Washington state, especially at the Washington state legislature. I had, I had this recurring fantasy that somebody will bulldoze the Washington state legislature, give the, all the marble and windows to Habitat for Humanity, sell the land to Marriott and turn it into something productive, a Marriott resort, and let the legislators work from homes or in, in, in warehouses or something more appropriate whether they accomplish or not. But anyway, um, a woman who, she still works for the Department of Corrections and she's in a fairly, she's in a middle level management position. She was so upset at what was going on at the Washington State Penitentiary that she literally got in her car and drove from Walla Walla, Washington to Seattle and came into our office and sat in my office in tears a couple of years ago that people, uh, who have lengthy sentences can't get into programming. And, and um, I have forgotten about that, although the issue is always on my mind. But uh, I, th I think uh, it kind of, to me, you know, in prison, it's, it's, if, if, if you look at, if you look at prisoners, it's two groups, really. I, I, I think we're so far past in the prisons and everybody will have a heart attack, but I, I, I think the larger issue is not racism anymore. I think it's classism and I think it's class warfare uh, or whatever you want to call it, but it's, it's um, in, in the prisons, uh, people of all races and genders are caught up and in a simple divide, people who can make it on their own after their release and people who cannot make it on their own after release. And that often uh, has a lot to do with comorbidity, uh, mental health, whether you're suffering serious mental illness, whether you're suffering serious mental illness plus addiction. But it, it, the, the dividing line in my mind is you can make it, is divide the prisoners into two groups, people who can make it on their own after release if they're willing to work hard at it and people who can't make it on their own without intervention. And um, what the DOC is doing is locking people out of the classes, locking the people who cannot make it on their own out of classes. Those are the people who need the head start for release and they're the people that are being denied it. Uh, and then the people who are getting access to programming, they're, um, they're the people that are within four years of release uh, that they, they can make it on their own. I mean, the DOC data breaks us down. I mean, we don't like, get you know, a 77% of recidivists are, are high risk to recidivate for the DOC. At least 34% of Washington's prisoners suffer serious mental illness. Uh, people that are low, moderate risk to recidivate uh, uh, don't basically don't recidivate. They make up about 10%. So there's strong data behind what I'm just kicking out here. And, uh, uh, and, and so you carry that forward to recidivism, you know, like what's going on with, with people catching new cases after release, uh, or dying from overdose or dying from suicide. Um, and, uh, and, and so if, it's pretty easy to make the argument that if you don't prepare the people, if you don't give the people who need the most opportunity to prepare for release a chance to program, then you're blocking, you're blocking those people from 
possibility of having having a chance of releasing and doing well. And and so that falls on it falls on the legislature. I mean, so I I, I wanna I wanna cut myself off here in a second, but it's like when when Douglas Allen, who's in the prison at Monroe that, that Emma just mentioned, Kate got on our radar. Um, I wrote and he's doing life and, and and because he's doing life, he's locked out of being on the program. He's a really bright guy. And, and he's motivated and, and driven to do well and, uh, and wants the program. But when 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 he came on our radar, I wrote to Daniel Armbruster about this issue that's been a long-standing issue for a long time. Daniel's um, assistant secretary in charge of reentry at, at the at the uh, at DOC headquarters, and and I'm like, is there any way to get people? like Mr. Allen and not just him, but people like him into, in, into programming. And, and she wrote back a really thoughtful, super lengthy email, which I'm glad to forward to anybody that asked for it. Just write me or .com at postprisonedu.org. It was a really thoughtful email. And she talked about, uh, and, and, and the reason I'm mentioning it is because Loretta Taylor, who's in charge of programs for DOC, just made a lie out of Daniel's email in writing yesterday. So, um, so uh, Danielle talked about DOC headquarters being willing to consider letting people like Mr. Allen into programs, into educational programming. And, and, and she said, what she said was she wanted to see that these are truly motivated people, not people that will waste the investment, but that they're really truly motivated and and um, not come see, come saw, like won't be have a fleeting interest in it, but will really work their butts off. And so then, and she said she'd like to know the person's name. So I wrote, responded, and I gave her Mr. Allen's name, and then I and then she, then I waited for her to get back to me. And she didn't. And then, and then I forwarded my earlier email, and I just said, "Danielle, I'm trying to move this up in your inbox." What's going? And, and so all of a sudden, and she did respond again. And then, uh, day before yesterday, her secretary, her executive administrative confidential person, whatever the big title is, forwarded an email from Loretta Taylor, who's. Um, She's the way I look at her is she's in, in uh, she's in charge of uh, programs at DMC headquarters. I'm looking for her most recent email so I can get the title right. Uh, and um, yeah, so she's education services administrator at DMC headquarters, and so like. Danielle's assistant forwarded an email from Loretta. They just made a total lie out of what Danielle had said earlier and just said budgetary concerns are such that we, we won't be able to let people like Mr. Allen in the program. So, um, Mr. Allen, who wants to program and build up a record of rehabilitation and it while locked up so he can go before the indeterminate sentence review board and prove to them that he would be a, a good person to be released into society. He can't do it. The, 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 he cannot do it. The Department of Corrections will not allow him to program. So um, yes, you know, with their like left hand, they want people to program at ISRB. I've testified in front of ISRB so many goddamn times, it's ridiculous. And the first question out of their mouth, even before hello, is, you know, show us, tell us what you've done while you've been locked up. You know, do you have a college degree? Have you done this? Have you done that? What have you done while you've been locked up? And, 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 and so that's a requirement. ISRB, by the way, is headquartered at DOC headquarters. And, and, and uh, so that's a requirement of, of the Indeterminate Sense Review Board. It's a requirement of DOC that if these people want to have a chance of having a free life and building a life worth living and, and, and being responsible in the future, they have to program, but the same state that requires them to program prevents them from doing it. Back to you, Emma. 
Well, I was going to say just again about that email that another thing that stuck out was, didn't she say essentially there are like, there are 156 eligible, eligible people on the waiting list before him. And we have to be fair to those people. Like it wasn't even like he was 157th in line. Like she was basically saying, no, we can't because of this hard cutoff. But also there are 156 people on a wait list not able to participate in programming either who are eligible like that i if i understood it right that also you, you, you did you did you under, you did so um i mean i don't know this is the second lovely radio show where i can't muster the level of passion that goes along with my thinking on this uh, uh it just like it's just egregiously wrong you know society supposedly wants people to rehabilitate while they're locked up wants them to program demands that they program but then refuses to to program refuses to let them to program and again that that it goes back mike how many times have you heard me fuss about roger e goodland who's chair of the public safety committee and daniel uh, uh, uh uh, God, I can't remember, Jeannie Darnell, uh, you know, who's in charge of, of, of human services and reentry at the Senate. You know, these, these are the people who are responsible for dollars being put in, in the DOC budget so that people like Loretta Taylor and the superintendents and education departments can let people in to these classes. And they're not doing it. So, the, you know, the, the, the ultimate responsibility is there. I mean, and the, you know, the not funny thing, uh, in one week, we had so many of these things pop up. I think Ari, I remember sitting in the, like in the bullpen area of the office and, and having lunch and Marley was talking about Blackwell and we were talking about Douglas Allen. And I know, Emma, you're working with a couple of people, and I'm guessing you are too. And it's, but the, um, I mean, it's just blatant dishonesty. If you, you know, was was there a movie or a book that talked about lying liars? I was like, you know, that that's government. That's Roger Goodman and Gene Darnell and Jay Inslee, and for that matter, you know, a legislator by the way. He's always been very interested in reentry and DOC issues. Um, came out two days ago, and I've got a direct quote in the email, like that he started out being hopeful about Cheryl Strange, as I did, and now he's already, you know, a couple of weeks into her being appointed by Inslee, like not seeing anything good. Uh, and I'm not seeing anything good either. I'm, and, and it's starting to look like one of the biggest disappointments ever but it's just they don't you won't find legislators or Inslee or his general counsel or his chief of staff or his deputy chief of staff or Cheryl Strange or anybody in state government just standing up in front of the Seattle Times or the or South South Seattle Emerald or spokesman review and saying we, we don't budget, we make it impossible for people to program, but that's what they do. But that's, that's what the they truth. do. That's it's exactly, I mean, yeah. So it's like, I don't know. I think there are two um, pretty well circulated, like facts and figures here that I, that I just wanna, um, I think they're well circulated among people who focus on these issues or work with these issues, but uh, maybe they're less well known. It is, you know, data um, shows that correctional education makes an individual 50 up to 50% less likely to recidivate. Participating in educational programming makes an individual up to 50% less likely to recidivate after they release. And, and um, another comes to just the financial um, figures. Re one dollar invested in education returns four to five dollars in taxpayer money um, by uh, reducing recidivism rates. So the and that's a I think that's a very large like Rand Corporation study. So 
the data is there to back up that um, these programs investing in it will save, I mean, a $1 investment with a 4 to $5 return on investing in correctional education, but the money is not there. We see that the money is not there. The, the opportunities are not there. Um, and I think that's exactly what you're talking about. And it's, um, but anyways, um, I'd also like to talk about like, just apart from these barriers, I think like um, Adrian, Ari, you guys, Ari the Younger, you guys both um, brought up some other, you know, like what else, um, some other individuals that we wanted to talk about who education um, is pretty infeasible for them for like other reasons. Um, who do we wanna talk about next, Adrian? Um, Darcy Andrews or someone? Well, well, I do have um, somebody that on my caseload that um, has ran into barriers surrounding access to internet and knowing how to navigate the internet and um, even open up his email and log on to things. It's like he doesn't have a clue on how to do those things and that has been a challenge in communicating with um, the individual. Um, I also have somebody that is at a facility where they were taking a program, they were in a program, um, I believe they were trying to get their ATA degree in business management and a certificate in small business. And so they had started the program and then the program facilitator or the advisor had told them that the teacher had said that they changed the curriculum and will no longer offer the last class until the end of the year, which is past his release date. So he's take spent all that time taking the class and he's not even going to be able to finish the class. And it, it kind of threw off his release plan and how he wanted to move when he got out. And just talking when are you had mentioned about the two groups of people that um either get the access to the education or don't get the access to education i feel like doc intentionally keeps some people from programming because they get more money to keep them locked up rather than they rather they rather get that cash flow than invest money in the programming to where they'll be successful and not recidivate. So that's my thoughts on it. You know, I want to, I mean, you mentioned return on investment being so high and, um, you know, last Saturday we had this graduation celebration for Jenny Barton. And if anybody doesn't know who she is, just Google Jenny, G-I-N-N-Y Barton, and you'll probably get like 10 million hits in one third of a second. Because she's Congratulations, so, Jenny. <laughs> she's so like uh, Eric Johnson from Como and his uh, was, was at uh, the celebration. And I and uh, asked me, you know, about what the about post prison education program involved with, with Jenny over the years, and then uh, the lady who was with him, and I think it was his wife, but I'm I, I'm not I'm not sure, but she was uh, super inquisitive, and I enjoyed talking to her. Was like um, asked about costs, and we had just had a board of directors member ask me for. a p &L statement on, on Jenny. So we, um, and, and so I knew the number. I know I know what we spent, not payroll dollars, which would double, triple the number, but I know what we spent in direct service dollars on Jenny over the last 11 years, and it's $13,000. And so like here, you've got this woman who's set the world on fire in a public way, graduated the University of Washington, uh, not in prison, uh, reunited with her kids uh, and been accepted into graduate school and has become an influencer. I mean, uh, to say the least, I mean, she, she just had the, uh, the biggest TV station in, in Germany just flew in and was at her house the other day. Um, and she's, you know, ABC, Good Morning Show, God knows how 
much media she's getting right now. But I, I'm talking to Eric Johnson from Como. I, I was thinking, like, what's a life worth? You know, so we, we, uh, uh, yeah, sure. You know the answer to that. Who asked me that? Yeah. Uh, so, um, we, uh, but anyway, so we spent $13,000 with, you know, lawyers, clothing, computers, tuition, books, groceries, housing, rent, and somebody puts their life together. And until we come along, all that happens is the DOC fails and fails and fails and fails again. I'm surprised anybody who works for the Department of Corrections has the audacity to show their face in public. I mean, the readmission rates are 50%, the recidivism rates 30.7%. All they do is fail. Half the people that are in the prisons right now are people that have been previously incarcerated. So, but for a, a, a relatively little amount of money, when you talk about return on investment, uh, we may we we paved the way for somebody to take charge of their life and do spectacularly well. And I don't know if Adrian wants to talk about it, but Adrian's right on par with Jenny. You know, like multiple incarcerations and all of that ended. You know, it was like come out and celebrate. You know, come out and celebrate. Come out and celebrate. But when got involved with us and and let us work for her and and now she's just again this amazing influencer and 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 um, so the thirty three thousand a year to incarcerate somebody with no programs available, just keep them locked up in warehouse, I guess and feed them pills and let them have some box and, and or um, give them a chance to program and, and, and prepare themselves for reentry and, and do well. So I want you to talk about JPay. I know you love JPay tablets, Emma. <laughs> and so it's like, I mean, th these tablets could be such a vehicle, you know, so, so, so like Loretta Taylor won't let somebody in the class Right, because and they got 156 people on a waiting list. Just this, this was in one prison, by the way. I think this is at the Twin Rivers Unit at Maroa Correctional Complex. So if you amplify that times all the prisons in the state, God knows how many are on a waiting list. But, but you know, a, a good, a, you know, DOC works with JPEG very closely. They're like joined to the hip, and 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 there could be instead of selling prisoners music. In tablets and junk, uh, they could be, you know, there could be really valuable programming on, on those tablets, and they they won't do it. And the DSC, which is in a position to demand that they do it, won't. Okay, here's here's the thing though is that is that that's that's actually not um, okay. Well, let me back up because because JPay um, could <laughs> JPay could and should be. Um, Sorry, Ari the Younger just said, I feel like um, Ari misunderstands uh, how you feel towards JPay, and you do. That was a joke when I said that. Uh, <laughs> All right, if you, you, in a couple more years, you'll learn this word called facetious. <laughs> it's F-A-C-E-T-I-O-U-S, I think, <laughs> being facetious. Okay. I, thought, I, I thought it was so obvious I was being facetious, I didn't think there was any chance that anybody would yeah. miss that. I meant okay. more the the educational opportunity through right. those JPay tablets was something that I know Emma has also taken issue with because it's just not sufficient. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Like that's what I um and this should be could and should be like a whole episode in itself. But um here's the issue with JPay tablets is is that the education that's provided on there one one it's not there like we know that it's not there and you're right that um the 156 people who are on the waiting list and barred from programming at all do not have educational material for the most part like on the tablets like jpay advertises uh on their website there's pictures of you know people in college graduation garb and advertising them as this educational tool and um it's it's not there. There is music, movies that they uh, pay for with their 
um, you know, some, you know, 19 cent an hour or something that it is salary. They buy movies and books and, you know, sometimes they don't work anyways, like, but there, but there are not classes on there as they advertise in, <clears throat> uh, you know, and so you're right that, that, that be better than nothing to at least have what you're advertising, have some sort of classes on the tablets. Um, that being said, um, which will not happen because JPay is, you know, JPay is a predatory company for them to really have quality <laughs> educational material on the tablets. Um, you know, it, I don't, um, you know, quality is not their focus, uh, rehabilitative, rehabilitative, um, you know, material. I think there are like, <clears throat> like some parenting courses available. I don't know. I was talking to um, one of our students who's in there about like what actually is on there right now. And there's like some self-help, self-guided course. And that is the extent of the educational material. Um, it's uh, far from what they advertise. Um, but the thing is, um, for individuals that like we have in mind who are barred from programming and who have no options right now, like um, what they do have the option for is correspondence courses that are hundreds of dollars out of their pocket to do the courses on the tablets, right? Like, and these courses are not, um, these, I mean, it, it, these individuals are capable of way more and they deserve an educational experience um, that is, you know, that has learning from, learning from students around them, learning from peers, having questions answered. Like there is, um, and that was like, sorry, <clears throat> that was one of the major points of my thesis is that it's not sufficient to have someone, you know, reading, it's like us in college, like reading a textbook, I wouldn't have um, been successful doing that, reading a textbook and answering questions and considering that, you know, a college education for myself. I mean, it's, it's something, but it's, I think, um, even more crucial for there to be a group learning environment, a learning community, um, yeah. and it stripped down I mean, that's what I consider it to be is as if you're reading a textbook and answering questions about it. Um, that's what um, would be the stripped down version of education that that then these predatory companies could claim that they are providing a college education and getting rid of the programs that come in and actually provide a quality experience that these individuals deserve because they're saying, oh, well, we already provide an education that's, you know, rid of all that messiness and all of the work that goes into providing that group learning environment by just, you know, it, it's essentially, it, you know, and it's, there is the correspondence with the teachers via email, um, but that's not necessarily something I support. Do I support it over nothing? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I think it's shocking that, um, you know, when I was doing work in New York, they didn't have, they also didn't have like the learning management system with the, with the courses on there and the full like access to take college courses. They had this like, um, like minimum, minimal version of like Khan Academy where you could watch some edu educational videos. And even that is not available in the uh, facilities in Washington where I've talked to people. There is nothing like mm. there. And so I support it over that having classes available. Um, I can't say that's something that I would, you know, necessarily argue for because I, I want more for these people. But anyway, so that's 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 where I, you know, wanted to clarify my stance on on uh, the potential of tablets for educational purposes. I think they are a, you know, a supplemental tool to um, and can facilitate out of the classroom learning. But anyways, I, I really do think that that the tablets and issues related to JPay is a whole separate conversation. But um, yeah. You know, years ago uh, at the prison out of Clown by 
there was a guy named Brian. Brian Walsh was the education director out there. And then he went on to, to have Pat's position at the state board. And then he went on to work for Vera. And that's when Pat came into the state board. Um, and um, but Brian got national acclaim because he he took um, he took the server that was in the ed in the um, education department at Columbia Bay, and he got permission from people like Kaplan and to download their website onto the servers, and it was really miraculous to stand in that room with prisoners who were on computers on, in the Kaplan website, but not really online on the Kaplan website, but everything that Kaplan and all these other really worthwhile websites had were downloaded onto the server that Peninsula had in the education department at the DOC's prison. And so they, people, prisoners could have a very lifelike uh, experience online, on computers, uh, learning, working with valuable stuff in a, in a community, you know, you know, prisoners together with educators. But um, that never got carried forward to overcome the hurdle that we were discussing earlier, because you still, the people who have sentences longer than four years wouldn't be allowed into that room, you know. But, you know, I, years ago, um, a guy named Dolphy Jordan, who's a close friend of mine, he did 21 years in prison. He went down 16 years old. He went down in 1989. And he came out of, he came out of prison. And he just did spectacularly well on, on the compass test. So like he came out, a CCO who was amazing, he just got frustrated with the DOC and left the Department of Corrections, but so he's up in Spokane. But he, when he was at Reynolds work release, he actually drove Dolphy over to the office and Dolphy, so Dolphy comes in. And we started working with him and we tutored him seven days a week, uh, literally preparing him for the compass test. And he placed college level on, on uh, reading and writing. And back then, compass test was writing and reading. And then there was math. And he paid, placed the highest level of adult basic education, 90, in math. And, and he attributed doing so well on reading and writing on the compass test and being able to go right into college level classes so a friend of his that he was locked up with, Dennis McDonald, um, encouraged him to read while he was locked up during his 21 years in prison. At some point, I think they were in an out-of-state prison in Arizona, but Dennis, Dennis got Dolphy to reading and not junk, these junk-ass paper back Western books and romantic novels and the, the, the crap that comes around on the cart in the prisons if you're a novel. You know, yeah, those are the go tos. <laughs> huh? No, I just yeah. said those are the go tos. Yeah, I mean, just, yeah, I mean, just, but, but like maybe the, a, a biography about Harry Truman or Pulitzer Prize winning books that just are super high quality. And, um, and, and so just being able to read those kind of books, that's why we spend, I don't know how much money we probably, sh you know, we ship books into prisoners. Have Amazon ship books into prisoners weekly, and and uh, um, and, and, but but being able to to just read, just read was huge for for him when he came out, and and then and you know there came the time, uh, South Seattle, all Seattle Community Colleges, South Seattle Community College, North uh, SBI, all of the campuses. Do a common graduation. It's at Benaroya Hall, home of the Seattle Symphony. And the year that Dolphy graduated, um, my little favorite picture um, of our 16-year history is Dolphy standing on the stage of Benaroya Hall, and the Chancellor putting putting the President's award around his neck. You know, so um, 
and he's found an amazing life with a beautiful kids and a wonderful wife and a beautiful home. And but the the start of that was reading while he was locked up, and and he placed he's told that story a million times. So like, but not, not even that's happening. I mean, not even that's happening. So I don't know. It's it's like. I mean, you know, we got we got really. This is a little off topic, but um, sometimes something happens with people we're working for that's just so discouraging that I get despondent. And like, uh, so we've got a student who's um, LRA. Most people won't even people who think they're an expert on DOC won't even know what LRA is, uh, but. Most won't, but it's it, it's kind of like you're out in the community, but you're still a prisoner. So it's limited, uh, re restrictive access or less restrictive access. So, so you're not like an intermediate security prison. You're not on the island at McNeil at, at Special Commitment Center. You're you're, but you're you're actually a prisoner as though you were in a prison or on McNeil, but you're out in the community, but under really intense scrutiny. <laughs> And so we've been working with this guy, Emma, who you know as well as I do, because you worked with him yesterday. Um, and and uh, his attorney, who's amazing, Sonia Hardenbrook, um, thought she had a, a firm agreement with Bob Ferguson, the Attorney General's office, that this guy in a couple months' time would be freed from LRA. And, and, and it would have... Uh, and then uh, that that commitment was broken yesterday, and so now Sonia will do what she's done so many times. She'll take it to trial, and she'll hand Bob Ferguson's dumbass pieces. Uh, let me start. I don't want Mike to go in the corner and arrest because I used the wrong profanity. Well, the SEC swoops in with their gunships, but you know these people that that deal with. with some, situations like we're talking about are just they're they're horrible i mean like lock a 12 year old boy up at age 12 um because of a, i mean i don't even know how you can commit a sex crime if you're 12 years old this kid was locked up at 12 and and uh, for years and even put on the McNeil Island, the Special Commitment Center, for nothing more than stealing a pair of panties from a next door neighbor and doing like a you show me yours, I'll show you mine kind of things that I think kids are curious about and do. Uh, but but so that group of people in Ferguson's office uh, decided that they're not going to go along with him being freed from LRA. And so Sonia will take him to trial like she like she has so many times. She'll she and a good jury will and Ferguson staff their ass and I'm looking forward to it. But uh, but we learned yesterday that for him to be free, she'll have to go to trial again. It's like, you know, years and in, 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 uh, it just. So, so on, on that on, on that level of. Disappointment uh, is people who are trying to want to build a life. Um, are being blocked from doing it. I mean, it's just incredible to me that the DOC demands that you program and then blocks you from programming. Publicly, their stance is you got to program, you got to program, you got to program. Nothing good can happen if you don't program. But behind the scenes, they're blocking you. And then, you know, I'm going to see if I can find that email from Loretta really quickly. Actually, it came from Daniel's assistant, and I'll, I don't want to read it. So y'all talk for a minute while I find it. Um, something I actually wanted to touch on was that, you know, we've been discussing um, people with release dates that are over four plus years out um, and the inact or inability to access education and programming with that. But something that I've actually been dealing with recently is um, there's a student who we're working with uh, named Sebastian and he, um, DOC had his release date for early May, and he is still uh, in prison. He's at Shelton, and you know he's he were looking at filling out FAFSAs and college applications, and we're trying to get him enrolled, but we don't know when he's going to be released. And in the meantime, there's no programming he can do 
to to help further his education, even though he's supposed to be released. Um, and I know that that was something that we encountered as well with um, Elida Reeves, correct? Um, where you have these people who were who should have been released, and because of some I don't know bureaucratic element um, that's preventing them from doing that, they they also just can't further or pursue their educational goals um, during this like period of just no communication from DOC, um, and um, and so and that's, that's, that that's like working with that's. I mean, that's a whole radio show. <laughs> and um, so you're what I see, you're, you're locked up, but you're past, you're locked up past your release date. And I, and I don't even know what to be interesting to see what Loretta Taylor at DSC headquarters would have to say about that. But those people can't get into programming. And, and, and there's, I mean, Roger, I was in a legislative Zoom meeting with Roger Goodman. Uh, a couple months ago, and when the Blake decision came down, and and they were estimating officially estimating 100 to 200,000 current and former prisoners cases were impacted by that. I think they were allocating 77 million dollars to recalculate all those sentences. So this huge high numbers. I mean, we just had you were just talking to a guy yesterday, are you, Carlos? You know, they just one minute you're a prisoner, then you go back for resentencing, then you're for, and then you're out of the streets. And so, but those people, if they're sitting in prison past the release date, DOC is not letting them, letting them program, and they should be free. DOC should be bringing them caviar, cream cheese, nasty spumani, Netflix movies, and 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 what can I do to make this egregious wrong be right for you? And instead, they just. <laughs> bury him further. No, you can't program. Just sit here. Sorry, you're past your release date, but just sit here, suck your thumb. To for God, don't get infracted. You know, don't cause trouble. And 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 no, you can't program. You know, so um, I don't even know. I want to. I want to read Loretta Taylor's email. This was like so after Danielle wrote Armbruster wrote that that. Under certain circumstances, if people were really motivated, she thought people should, who are serving long sentences, should be looked at as being a chance to get into uh, programs. And then, and then a month goes by, and then all of a sudden, Caroline Metzger, who's Daniel's executive assistant, sends this email to me. What she it is, so she gets this email, and this is specifically in reference to. Getting Douglas Allen being able to program so that over six or seven years he can build a record that he can show ISRB and possibly go home and come out in the community as a valued person as opposed to staying in prison at 35 grand a year. So, but Loretta wrote, We currently have 156 on the approved wait list. And like Emma, like you said, that's the wait list. So she's not talking about people that are, are programming. These are people waiting to program at one small prison. This is the Twin Rivers Unit at Monroe, which would verify GEDs <coughs> at TRU, which I when I took that to mean so so they want you to have a, they want you to be under four years and have a verified GED in what a tuxedo and a Rolls Royce and a servant and <laughs> what before before you can possibly get you know program at TRU. To get into the degree program offered through Edmonds College, based on the reasons Mark Kuchka previously mentioned, we have to prioritize those lists and fairness to the population and to be good stewards of our resources. We hope to serve mm -hmm. everyone, but unfortunately, as previously stated, we simply do not have the fiscal space or financial resources will allow us to do so. You know, honestly, I want to say, I want to say that that. Uh, I can't use the F word, but I want to say that is the dumb effing this email and statement that I've ever read or heard in my entire effing life. If you want to protect your resources, protect people, help people prepare to do well after release so they don't come back in your goddamn prisons at 35,000 a year. I, I mean, that was like to write an email is ignorant and dumbass as that email is, I think I'd have to work on it for a month. 
I can't, oh, I write on it for a week or a couple of hours. Now I'll come back tomorrow. Let's see, how can I even make it more stupid than it was yesterday? And then after a month of every day making it more stupid than the day before, then finally email it to Ari Khan so he can have a heart attack. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. Damn. <laughs> Maybe that was their motive. Like, I'd, ha I'd read it, get so pissed off. I'd go right. And, it, and they'd be rid of me. <laughs> Yeah. You ain't going and, to no time soon. I tell you, you know, Ellen Vale was, uh, I think he had retired, uh, but I, something happened and I, and he and I stay in touch, uh, and I have the greatest respect for him. He was secretary of DSC for a while and he was at a high level of DSC for 30 <laughs> years. And, but I asked Ellen one day, I, I'm like, I, I said, I, I said, I, I get the feeling that if I had a heart attack there and died, the program went under, there'd be cell, there'd be celebration at, at, at the FC headquarters and for Bain and Melvin said, there's some of that. <laughs> you know, it'd be like, it's kind of like what Pat Sievers was saying the other day, you know, you know, we, we, we maybe cause some hassles or, you know, we, 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 we try to require the Department of Correction more than than other nonprofits do or other entities do, but but uh, damn, that's just the, the most ignorant email. I, I I'm 74 years old as of yesterday. I don't think if I live to be 100, I'll ever read a more ignorant email. It's, it's, it's going back to what you said, Emma, on costs and, and return on investment. If you want it, Loretta. If you want, I'm going to write it to her, but if you want to protect the resources of the state's taxpayers and let the people who need to program the most program and stop focusing on the people who can make it on their own and probably won't recidivate anyway. Just some conversations I can't have without extreme profanity and then Mike goes crazy and he has cardiac arrest and SEC applies <laughs> and with the gun ships and we all go to federal prison again. <laughs> you know, but if I was in federal prison, it'd be really cool because I wouldn't have to get stupid ass email like that one from, from Daniel's assistant. Couldn't get email like that. It was so it was so backwards. It was so backwards. That's right. Um, um, yeah. Um. Pet peeve. Adrian, in terms of reentry, we only got eight minutes to go, seven minutes. Pet peeve? Let me ask this again, if you don't mind, if I'm making this too personal, next time you see me, you can knock me out. But, uh, but, uh, the, the, you know, you know, like Keith Whiteman refers to himself as a recidivating machine, you know, like come out, go back, come out, be released, go back six times. And then, so, so you got, you had X number of incarcerations and what, what would have, what, what could the Washington State Department of Corrections have done um, earlier? in your life to save you wasting so many years of your life. I mean, if you take the last years of your, your life since you started school and in and, and, and this spectacular, what you've done is spectacular. And, 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 and that could have started earlier, you know, so what could the goddamn state have done? I mean, just do what we did or do something else. What could they have done in, in terms of Loretta Taylor's resources, what could they have done uh, to have you, to move you along years earlier than happened? The work program allow you a program. <laughs> Go ahead. The access is a word that keeps coming to my head when you ask me that. Like I don't, I just thinking back when I was younger and in and out of prison and just seems like I was just being ran through this system like cattle or something like that. It wasn't really like there was not, I don't know. I feel like access to programming would have been 
would have been good for me early on instead of having to jump through so many hoops just to get my needs met. Um, whether it was my medical education or whatever it was, it seemed like I was always fighting to get the basic things that I needed just to live. Um, so, I don't know. All right, what do you think the answer is for the students that you're working with or applicants that you're working with? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I just briefly, I feel like this also, what Adrian was just saying goes back to the last radio show when we were talking about medical negligence, but like, if you're bleed, if you're dying, <laughs> it's hard to like, really put like fight for, you know, your educational goals. There are a lot of really pressing issues that inmates are dealing with on a daily basis that they don't have the energy or they can't put the energy into fighting for their educational access because they need access to like proper health care and um anyway that's Is this that's, your email that i sent to everybody a couple hours ago have you had a chance to look at it it's, it's exactly along what you're talking about so a lawyer uh i'll just read it but a lawyer um sent uh, an email to me earlier this morning and she she said uh, uh, hold on, I got my cars she said I was contacted by a potential client who was assisting a prisoner who has been diagnosed with stage four cancer and this lawyer is a fairly high-powered lawyer with a high-powered firm said to me in the email that the prisoner is receiving chemo and radiation but is facing considerable difficulties in getting other treatment and medications he needs um, and then she was the lawyer was wanting to be able to pass our contact information on to the prisoner who's down at the Washington State Penitentiary, but it's exactly what you just said, Ari. I mean, stage four cancer. I, I mean, I don't want that. You know, so like maybe it's like none of their needs are being met. Right. Well, right. Yeah. if anybody's having their needs met, it's the people who don't need to have their needs met or need to have their needs met the least. And right. I that's like I don't even know. Uh, who sang that song, Bang the Drum Softly? I guess I could Google that. So like, I don't even, you know, like if you bang the drum softly, nobody in state government or DSC is gonna do anything about this. But and this this is such a big issue. If you bang the drum loudly, it's, it's not gonna get anywhere, you know? But, but so I guess to answer your question, go back, all right, and, and and keep talking about what you think. I mean, the people you. Yeah, yeah. To answer your question, I guess it would be what Adrian was saying about access to to these educational opportunities, but then also just like getting those basic needs met in order to pursue those educational opportunities, um, or to 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 look for them, um, and. Um, you know, with the, with the students I'm working with, I mean, there's varying levels of, the, you know, difficulty and why, um, they are facing that difficulty, but yeah, I'm with Adrian, just access and also information. I think the big thing is, is, you know, having these prisoners understand what, um, educational outlets are available to them and how they can go about pursuing that, um, along with letting them pursue that um i think those two are really they work in tandem we're down to 59 minutes so we got less than a minute ago but what you just said reminds me so my first meeting with the department of corrections was march it was january 29th of 2006 at doc headquarters in tumwater and it was in uh, the secretary's big conference room harold clark was there the secretary it was the day I met Alvin Vale. He was there as Deputy Secretary of the Prisons Division. And Mike Paris, who was in charge of programs, he's retired now and, uh, from DOC for quite a few years. He was in there. And I think a, a Deputy Secretary, maybe Karen Daniels, who was in charge of Community Corrections, was there. 
And, um, and at that time, Mike Paris was proud to announce to us and everybody I brought with me that day, the DSC had budgeted $15 million. <laughs> I think the biennial budget at the time was eight was was uh, 1.8 billion. They had 8,000 employees, $1.8 billion biennial budget and DOC's program person. This is this is the guy who was in the position that Loretta Taylor's in now, was proud to announce to us that they had they had done 15.2 they had budgeted 15.2 million for, for education and, and programming that shows you right there where the DOC's priority is it's like that's as good as flipping the bird and 18,000 people and their families as if there's anything I've ever seen I think Emma you need to write a newsletter for us to send out to our listener about this I'm sure get a uh, 90 minutes I'll try to keep yeah. it down all right, in the we're out of time, Mike. You're going to have to edit something out of this uh, to get us down to one hour. Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> if you got any questions, so like uh, Adrian's email is adrian.tunny at postprisonedu.org. Emma is emma.hogan or just Emma? Emma.hogan. At, at postprisonedu.org. Ari is Ari. Rose dash Marquez at postprisonedu.org. Mine's ra.com at postprisonedu.org. The website's postprisonedu.org. Um, and the main number is 206 408 5560. You know, join, join, join us and help us cause trouble. <laughs>